Hi and welcome to my midweek video. How are you coping with the humidity? Got up this morning, got showered, went out walking and thanked God that I'm not still morbidly obese because in this heat, or more specifically this humidity, I just did not cope. And going out there this morning at just under nine stone, it was like, phew, how I could have done that 10 or even 13 stone heavier as I was, I do not know. But it explains to me why I always felt so sick and tired. So, yeah, I'm melting, but it could be worse. <laughs> right, I watch a lady on um, YouTube who's plant-based and her name's Storm. And I just was flicking through her channel. She put a new video up yesterday afternoon. And she made a dish which she called Cowboy Caviar. And it just immediately like made my mouth water and got me thinking, that's my kind of perfect dish. So Jo made it there and then, and this is it. And does that show on camera, Jo? Yeah. In here, there's red onion, sweet frozen sweet corn we used. There's black eyed beans and there's black beans. Unfortunately, Jo had cooked both of those in the instant pot yesterday morning. Although in the recipe, Storm does use tinned ones, so tinned are fine. But now we're used to cooking our own beans, the tinned ones just don't taste good enough. You get used to that fresh cooked taste. Um, what else is in there, Joe? Oh, a pepper, a red pepper. You could use whatever colour you wanted. And there's chopped tomatoes, but you kind of drain the water off them because you're making a salad in effect. You're not making a sloppy, stewy, soupy thing. Uh, we put onion powder in, we put chilli in, she put jalapeno pepper in, but we actually just put chilli flakes in. And then she put in red wine vinegar, whereas I chose to put in caramelised onion balsamic vinegar from the new collection that I just bought, which are really nice, by the way. And honestly, I wish this was smelly vision because I've just taken this out of the fridge and the smell coming off this. God, it's lovely. It just smells of fresh vegetables and deliciousness. So what I'm going to ask Jo to do, for anybody who's interested, is link Storm's video below, because she does it much more justice than I do. But I just wanted to recommend it. I shall be having some of that for lunch. You could eat it cold, it would be so refreshing on a day like this. Or you could warm it, put it over a jacket potato, put it on top of a pile of... Um, wholemeal pasta or in my case brown basmati rice and I think you've got an easy meal there. Now I would say for me that's probably two, three portions maybe depending on what I have it with but it, I think that's going to become one of my staples because it's got everything in it that I like and you could put other things in, you could put peas in, you could put different beans in, you just adapt it to your own taste. So that's my um, Cowboy coming up. Excuse me. Here, Joe is soaking um, brown rice and he's also soaking quinoa. And that's something that we do now. We soak our grains overnight and then we'll cook up a batch which will be enough for two or three or maybe four meals. I think you've probably got enough in there for four meals, Joe, yeah? Yeah, four. And then what Joe will do when he, when he cooks it He'll put the water on to boil and add his brown rice. We cook brown basmati for about 25 minutes. After 10 minutes, when he's got 15 minutes left, he'll add his quinoa and mix it and it's gorgeous. And quinoa's got a lot of protein in it, so you're not being excessive on your protein, but it does help to get in your daily amount of protein. That's something I've been looking at we can very very easily overeat on protein and the more you read about it the more you realize it can be actually quite damaging to your health to overdo protein i think for a woman of my um height and weight i probably need about 40 45 grams of protein a day there are ways of working it out for your height i think it's 0.8 times your weight in pounds or kilos or something. No, no. And the thing you get confused about as well is it's not 40 grams of chicken. <laughs> yeah, it's this was something Joe had to point out to me because I'm like, 40 grams of protein. Well, I eat 250 grams of beans a day. And he said, yeah, no, you don't work it out like that. 
if you look at something, only a percentage of it is actually protein, a percentage of it will be fat, a percentage of it could be carbs. So you look at what percentage of, say, if you were having 100 grams of chicken, you look at what percentage of that is well, yeah, protein. Just look at the nutrition labels and how many grams yeah. of protein there are. But if it's something like beans, which don't come with um, nutritional labels, it's always available on on the internet, it will easily tell you. I think even if you ask your smart speakers, it will tell you how many grams of protein are in 100 grams of beans or whatever. Yeah, it tells us on the back of the bag. Yeah, but something that shook me the other day, and, and it was in something I was re well, listening to on a podcast, and it was a really good medical podcast, and it was, it was talking about um, kidneys and how you can get damage to your kidneys by over, and I mean really overeating proteins. And one of the things it was warning against was um, if you're type 2 diabetic. It actually said, now this is me quoting a podcast, this is not me thinking I know it all, but it actually said, if you're type 2 diabetic, really be aware of this, because we can have blood tests to see if our kidneys are functioning properly, and most of us will probably have had those liver and kidney tests over the years. But until your kidneys are actually 90% damaged, often the damage doesn't show up in the blood test. So you can be doing damage and, and just out of ignorance or just, we don't know, if we don't know these things, we can't do anything about it, can we? We're doing our best, but if we don't know all the information, sometimes we can, we can be doing it wrong. So be aware. There's a lot of talk on um, social media about eat more protein, eat more protein, the more protein you eat, the fuller you are, whatever. Um, I would argue that with anybody. It's not about just satiety, it's about the content of what you're eating. You know, protein and carbs are exactly the same calories. One gram of protein is four calories, one gram of carbs is four calories. And then people will say to me in emails and things, oh, I can't eat carbs, I eat protein because carbs make me put weight on. Well, hang on a minute. Where within our bodies are the little switches that go, I run on carbs or I run on protein? We all talk about running on calories. And carbs and protein are exactly the same number of calories. So unless there's something specifically amazing about me as an individual, my body reads the calories. I, I just, I'm confused when people say, I've had seriously fat friends. I used to be a seriously fat friend to a lot of people, so I'm not being judgmental. But I've had seriously fat friends who've never touched carbs for years. You know, people of my age group have not touched carbs for years. And if I said to them, you know, I've made a meal and they, they, oh, I can't eat that. I don't eat carbs because carbs make me fat. Well, hang on a minute. You still tend to stone overweight and you haven't eaten carbs for years. I think sometimes we hang our hat upon an excuse. And I think for me, it's taken me a long, long time to realise carbs are not dangerous. Whole grains, whole food carbs are not dangerous. The thing that was dangerous to me was refined carbs. There's a massive difference between eating whole grain brown basmati rice and eating, you know, white pasta. Something I learned yesterday, um, white rice, calorie-wise, is 10% more calories than brown rice. That surprised me. That was yesterday. You were filling me in on that, weren't you? Because we actually read it in a book. And I said, I don't understand that. Why would it be more calories? And it's because you've taken the outside off it, and it changes it. Because the outside, which is the fibre, has no actual calorie. So if you take the outside off all the rice and you're just eating the insides, the, the weight that would have been the fiber has gone, so you're replacing it with more of the weight of the inside of the rice, which is all calories. Whereas the outside part, which was the fiber, had no calories because it was fiber. And it's just little things like that. And okay, a pound of brown rice is about 500 calories cooked. A pound of white rice cooked is about 550 calories. So it's just little things like that that just astound me. You know, after being focused on losing weight for the last probably five, well, ten years, I've been trying to get down to this sort of size. I've been around this sort of size for over five years, but 
all that time, I mean, my major project, my major interest is nutrition and food and calories and what's good, what should I be eating, what shouldn't I be eating, and I didn't know that. And it's not like a massive world-changing thing, but I'm learning that the fibre comes calorie-free. The fibre fills me up, the fibre keeps me regular. I've gone from somebody who was openly and honestly struggling with constipation in my videos a few weeks back to somebody who's now so regular and as regular as clockwork you could literally set your alarm by me and that's not because i'm taking any form of liquid medication you know all these like fiber gels and things which some of us have probably used over the years and lactulose and stuff like that i don't need anything like that now i'm going better than i've ever gone but also those things are not like conducive with our gut bacteria. If you can change it, if you've got a problem with constipation like I had, and that, again, I'm not judging anybody. It's only because I've been there that I understand these things now. If you've got a problem with constipation like I had, look to proper fibre, whole grain fibre, before you look to go in and spend six quid on a bottle of lactulose or going to your doctors and but getting yet more and more fibre gel or whatever they give you these days because it's so much better for your gut bacteria i think now with the way i'm eating i've got happy gut bacteria i visualize all these little creatures jumping up and down with happiness because i'm feeding them whereas before i was starving them and that's why they were rebelling and did they make me pay for it <laughs> yes they did you can cure hemorrhoids you know by eating more fibre. Now, we don't talk about hemorrhoids very often, do we? But it's there, it's a fact. How many people, especially people of my generation, it gets worse as you get older, I'll tell you, but how many people of my generation struggle with hemorrhoids? We take all sorts of creams and remedies and suppositories where all we really need to do is eat more fibre, you know? And proof it works. There's an admission for you. Okay. The other thing that I want to do briefly today, well it might not be that brief, you know how much I talk. The other thing I want to do today, there's a lovely lady who's become a dear friend to me who comments regularly on my channel as Susan one and only. And a couple of weeks ago, Susan sent me a couple of clippings from her local parish magazine because she thought I'd find them interesting and I did. Now one of the clippings on the back of it had an advert for an old people's home. I thought she was dropping hints, but actually it looked that good. I was thinking of booking myself in for a fortnight. Anyway, turned it over and realised she meant the other side. I want to share one of these clippings with you because it just made me reminisce about the 1950s. Well, I was born in 1956, but the early 1960s, I'd say the first five years of the 60s, were very much the same as the last five years of the 50s. And the things on this list, Jo was reading it to me, I was finding myself going, oh my God. Oh, I remember that. We did that, whatever. So I'm going to ask Jo to read this list of reminiscences to you about the 1950s. And it's really just to illustrate that those of us who want to lose weight today, I believe have got a harder job of it because so much more temptation, so much more food you can easily get addicted to, so much more choice. We didn't have to battle a lot of the things in the 1950s and 60s that you younger people are having to battle today. Now, I'm battling them today as well, because it's just as much in my life a part of, you know, can I eat that? No, I can't. Should, how do I avoid that? Oh my God, I'll desperately want that. So I'm going through all the same stuff that anybody else is going through today. But I want to share with you the freedoms that we had back in the 50s and 60s. And just to highlight, unless your grandma's already told you, this is what life was like back then. Okay, Joe, take it from the top. Okay, uh, pasta had not been invented. It had in Italy, but it hadn't made it to England. Never had pasta, never saw pasta. Curry was the same. Yeah, I, who was that? There used to be a politician, didn't they, called somebody curry? But we hadn't got a clue about spices and spicy food. It just didn't exist. Uh, a takeaway was a mathematical problem. Yeah, a takeaway or an add to or a times by or a divided by. That's the closest we got to takeaways. Three minus two equals one. A pizza was something to do with a leaning tower. We had done the leaning tower of pizza 
Pisa, as we called it, um, when I was at school. We, we knew about that because we have a leaning tower in Chesterfield, which is not far from where I grew up. So we did like a project, the difference between the two leaning towers, quite big differences. But no, we would never have been to Pisa for a holiday. And pizza, well, no, we'd just never seen anything like that. Bananas and oranges that only appeared at Christmas time. Yep. When I was a little girl, I mean, I was born like 10, 11 years after the war, those sort of fruits were luxuries. Now, we had apples and pears because we had apple trees, pear trees, plum trees. And um, I grew up in a big village. Well, not such a big village, actually. It was small then. But most houses had land. Most people had orchards. But you can't grow bananas or oranges in North Nottinghamshire. Um, mind you, global warming, you might be able to soon, eh? But we didn't see things like that. The only time I remember seeing an orange was at Christmas. You got um, an orange in the, the toe of your stocking, and then you put it back in the fruit bowl. <laughs> but that was our family tradition. But no, they were luxuries. And believe me, I mean, I've heard stories of after the war, kids trying to eat bananas with the skins on because they didn't know you had to peel them. Weren't we poor souls? Next. All crisps were plain. The only choice we had was whether to put the salt on or not. When I was a child, the only crisps we ever had were called Smith's crisps. And in the bag, inside, and they were just a little bag. We didn't have multi packs or big bags. We weren't, I mean, if you had a little packet of crisps, you thought you'd made it. But in the bag was a little, um, like, waxed paper, navy blue waxed paper twist of paper with some salt in. And some people, once they opened their bags, would sprinkle the salt on. Most people didn't. We just didn't. Yeah. A Chinese chippy was a foreign carpenter. I like that, a Chinese chippy, a foreign carpenter. We had never, I'd never seen a Chinese person. We had no Chinese takeaways, anything like that. I think back then it wasn't such a, a welcoming country to come to. We were very fortunate in, later in the 60s when a lot of people chose to come here to work because we needed the workers after the war and everything. So, yeah, it wasn't normal for Chinese people to run businesses in our local towns. Rice was a milk pudding, another part of our dinner. Yeah, the only rice you had back then was rice pudding, honestly. The long grain rices, the basmati rices, the jasmine rices, all these different rices just did not exist. The only rice you could buy at the co-op was pudding rice. A big mac was what we wore when it was raining outside. <laughs> I liked this one. When we were kids, we all had gabardine macs for school in the winter. And a big mac, literally. Yeah, the only mac. Well, two Macs came into my life. My Uncle Mac, whose surname was Mac Mullen, but we called him Uncle Mac. And my raincoat Mac. Um, McDonald's hadn't made it to our part of the world back then. Cool. Uh, brown bread was something only poor people ate. Yeah, cheap bread wasn't as white. You know, like you had your really good white loaves. I'm trying, I'm trying hard to remember who they were made by back then. But you had a good quality white sliced loaf. And you know, have you ever heard that expression, the best thing since sliced bread? And when we started getting sliced bread back then, like Wonder Loaf or whatever, we thought it was amazing. Um, because all we'd had prior to that was the bread that my mum baked once a week, or the bread my granny baked once a week. And they both used good flour, but cheap flour was always a bit off-white. So when people made their own bread or when you bought really cheap bread, it wasn't as white. Um, I don't know whether how they make it so white these days, but yeah, that's true. Oil was for lubricating, fat was for cooking. Spot on. This made me think about it. You know, my first, first experience of olive oil was a little bottle about this big that you bought in the chemist to put in your ear if you had an earache. That was olive oil. That's the same olive oil that we then went on to learn to cook with, but that was much, much later. Because back in the day, we cooked chips in lard. We had something called trek. We had um, the first bottles of oil that, that became available. And again, I'm racking my brain to think what they were. People will be able to 
add it in the comments. But the first time I ever saw a bottle of oil, my grandma changed over from cooking with lard. We, we all used to have a chip pan with a basket. And when you weren't using it, when you finished with it, you put it to the back of the stove and the lard would set solid again. And you put the lid back on and you put it away. Well, grandma had this wonderful idea that she should um, buy a bottle of this new cooking oil that was out and the name is escaping me and she she cleaned her chip pan and the outside of your chip pan used to go black eventually i'm sure that won't any ours but she cleaned the chip pan she poured the bottle of oil in she cooked the chips and then she was like to granddad ernie what do i do with this now because it doesn't set solid so ernie in his wisdom said margaret he said wait till it cools down and pour it back into the bottle so Margaret did. She let it cool down, good old Nan. She got a funnel, she poured it back into the bottle and she stood there with her hands on her hips and she went, bloody hell. And my grandma didn't swear. She went, she were a lady. And Ernie said, what's up? And she said, look how much it's gone. And she poured it back into the bottle and the quarter of the bottle had disappeared. Of course it had, it had soaked into the chips and then it had soaked into us. And she said, you never noticed that so much with the lard. Well, it's true you didn't, but it just shows you a quarter of a bottle, which was probably, I don't know, it wasn't a litre, because we didn't have litres back then, it might have been a pint, pint and a half, probably. It, it must have been more than a pint, or it wouldn't have been enough to cook the chips. But a quarter of the bottle had gone, and when you think, that was probably 12, 1300 calories, just vanished into our lovely chips. Yeah, that was oil back then, but we cooked with fat. We cooked with... Um, bacon grease or we cooked with lard we hadn't heard of ghee and things like that and it was just a different world totally different world and food tasted wonderful chips cooked in lard are incredible but very fatty okay the tea was made in a teapot using tea leaves and never green yeah oh we never had a green tea i mean joe drinks green tea now and it's but he has the powdered, what do you call it, ceremonial green tea, and, and it's just powder and you add water. Never heard of anything like that back then. We had Yorkshire tea, and it was tea leaves, and we had a proper teapot, and a proper tea cosy, and a proper tea strainer. But it was a lovely cup of tea. A lovely cup of tea. When tea bags first came in, and Nam decided to use them, Ernie was saying, this is not good enough, these are the sweeping ups off the floor, that's all they're putting in these, don't taste like tea, and he stuck with his tea leaves, so we kept our tea caddy, and, and Grandpa Ernie stuck with his tea leaves, he wouldn't have tea bags, yeah, the good old days, eh, any more? Coffee was camp and came in a bottle. Yeah, I won't tell you people that were camp, coffee could be camp, coffee as camp in a bottle, is liquid chicory and we we decided a couple of years ago in a moment of madness to try it and we bought a bottle i think it was in sainsbury's and i made a cup because i'm like my mum used to drink this in the 60s well my mum lived on it because she was always on the diet she lived on black camp coffee and um i made a cup came home made a cup and omg it is full of sugar I don't remember that in the 60s. So I rang up my mum and I said, you know when you used to drink camp coffee? She, yeah, loved it, she said. So was it sweet? No, she said, because I've never taken sugar in my drinks. And my mum's drunk black tea and black coffee the whole of my life. That's where Joe got the habit from. My mum and dad have always done it. And Joe's never had milk in his drinks, always drunk it black. And she said, no, it definitely wasn't sweetened or I wouldn't have been drinking it. You must have bought, like there must be an alternative version. So we went back and we looked, and no, camp coffee now has added sugar. It's so different. So we had to throw it away because it was just like liquid chicory with sugar. But that was all we had. We didn't have Nescafe or all the different brands. I mean, nowadays you can go into the supermarket and choose from like 50 different coffees, can't you? We use Nespresso when we have endless choice. But back then it was camp or nothing. Yeah. In a bottle about that tall and about the size of an HP sauce bottle. Say, the good old days, or not? I don't know if we're going to have to save over half these for another day, because we're... <laughs> shall we save them for another day? Uh, or shall yeah, I just... want to get to halfway? No, uh, go on, let's get to halfway. Uh, cubed sugar was regarded as posh. Oh, it was. The only time I'd had cubed sugar as a child was in Betty's. Now, I probably was a bit older by then. Betty's in York or Betty's in Harrogate 
used to have cubed sugar back then. I'd never seen it anywhere else. But I don't know. I mean, I can't remember when those places opened. I could well have been a bit older by then. But we never had things like that at home. That would have been just too posh. Yeah, um, only Heinz made beans. True. Yet there was no choice for your baked beans. Heinz made baked beans, and then eventually, I think it was Cross and Blackwell's did one. But that's why beans means Heinz. Not Branston. Not Branston. Branston beans are quite new. Oh. Yeah, they've not been around that many years. Right. Branston pickle. Well. That's what Branston always made pickle. Yeah. What? Next. The, tin, the tin's got quite an old design on it. It Has seems it? like it should have been around for a while. No, I don't remember Branston back then. Um, fish didn't have fingers in those days. <laughs> no, you had fins, fish fingers. I mean, when we were, I don't know, probably not that old. Fish fingers probably came in in the 60s. But um, he didn't eat a lot of fish because it was a luxury, it was expensive and we weren't that posh, we were very working class. Um, we didn't have posh things like fish pies and that and we didn't have fish and chips from the chippy because we didn't live anywhere near a fish and chip shop. But fish fingers came in probably in the 60s and were only bird's eye, but they were nice. Yeah. Um, eating raw fish was called poverty and not sushi. <laughs> That's quite good, poverty, not sushi. Um, I'm saying we didn't eat fish, you know, but my grandma used to occasionally cook us fish and chips, and she, the fish man used to come round every other Friday. She'd go get some tail end pieces of cod, and she would batter them for us. But I'm not quite sure about the poverty, not sushi. Um, I mean, I, I used to eat a lot of sushi, but it's not really made with raw fish when you buy it in the supermarkets, is it? But I will take that one as tongue in cheek. Okay, that's halfway. That's halfway. Okay, we'll bring the rest next Wednesday as part of our midweek video. I'm sitting here now and it is so hot in this kitchen. I'm about to melt. So I'm off to put myself in front of the fan. Thanks for listening and we'll see you on Saturday. Bye.